so though we follow the uh, question and answer mode uh, like to start with uh, dr balaji ganeshan to share his uh, journey uh, on the same lines what miss neha and uh, mr prem started with uh, because his journey in the healthcare where he rolled out the startups uh, particularly the addressing the question like how you converted your proof of concept into mvp and a product what were the challenges uh, you actually faced Yeah, sure. Dr. Balaji, please. No, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity um, uh, to to be here uh, and inviting me to be a panelist. Um, let me start from the beginning. Um, I was one of you all. I did my bachelor's in biomedical engineering from University of Mumbai, um, D J Sangvi uh, College of Engineering, and in 2004, that is, and I went to the U K to do my PhD in medical imaging. in uh, biomedical uh, engineering specifically so as quite focused from the very beginning that i wanted to do something in medical imaging or biomedical engineering um, that's how i started my bachelor journal journey and um, when i reached uk i guess uh, i have a lot of sentiments with uh, uh, the way all the previous speakers have highlighted i was quite entrepreneurial to the very beginning um, i wanted my phd research to be funded rather than self funding I, uh, because it's post graduation um you 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 you'd want to um, work in the area that is actually relevant and you seek external grant funding rather than probably paying money out of your own pocket where where it's not um, part of your actual uh, education so went through the whole process of uh, proving my metal in 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 the uk i worked with a very eminent uh, radiologist so i totally concur uh, with you in terms of having a fantastic mentor i think mentor can break or uh, make your uh, career and um, and and definitely the mentor i had professor ken miles who is a very eminent uh, radiologist in the uk um, i uh, owe him whatever i am today in terms of all the learnings and one thing he very early on um started or asked me in terms of my phd uh, he said balaji what did you want out of your phd and i think this also concurs with lot of what was already said do you want a phd with some really good publications and a nice big thesis sitting in in a in a library or do you want it to have practical value and i said ken definitely the latter uh, practical value and that's how that's how the journey started and um, the idea so i come from a radiology medical imaging background um so the idea was can we extract more out of your exquisite radiology scan ct scans mris we all hear about it today if you sneeze or if you have any small uh, health issues the first thing that a doctor says is get a scan done be it an x ray be it a ct be it an mri or also there's so much information in these scans that we don't have enough radiologists we don't have enough nuclear medicine physicians in not just in india it's a global problem so we need softwares to harness that information out of uh, those images and with the advancement in instrumentation and scanner technology in when i started we used to get 16 20 images per patient now we get thousands of images per patient so it's not humanly possible for a radiologist to spend the whole day looking at one patient scans over 1000 images there's there's lot of volumes you go to any cancer hospital you see tons of patients so it's humanly impossible so that's where software ai artificial intelligence machine learning augmented intelligence as we call it has a great role to play and and today it's everyone's talking about ai i think when i started my phd in 2004 it was quite new novel uh, in the area of radiomics where i have pioneered um, the idea of radiomics is like your genomics or your proteomics get more information out of imaging now what is the advantage here patient anyways has a scan data is there if we extract more information from it we are increasing the utility of that resource you're not asking the patient to undergo any invasive procedures no additional biopsies no additional tests images non invasively has been acquired get more out of it get increase your value uh, proposition here so that was a concept that started off uh, with ken ken miles uh, in in 2004 and uh, i faced a lot of resistance initially now if you imagine the field of radiology now historically 
Radiology is a field where a radiologist looks at a scan, sees what he or she perceives and reports. Or they see an abnormality, they report it. There is a mass, there is um, some abnormality, they report it. If they don't do anything beyond it in terms of risk stratification, can you tell something whether it's going to be an aggressive cancer or a less aggressive cancer? Whether the patient's going to have good outcome to chemotherapy or whether the patient's going to have poor outcome to conventional therapy. These are more imp these are relevant questions after you have diagnosed the cancer. And for that, you rely on biopsy, you rely on genetics, you rely on liquid biopsies, you rely on blood tests, a lot of other tests are done. So the idea that we had earlier on was, can we extract more information from the scans and tell beyond that the naked eye could perceive, that the radiologist could t uh, perceive, rather than just tell there's an abnormality or not, can we tell whether it's, uh, it's very aggressive, if it's aggressive, whether the patient will respond to so-and-so treatment or not. The issue in cancer care today is, I guess we have a lot of options, a lot of therapeutic options. But if you don't treat the patient rightly at the very first opportunity, you have missed the boat. In the sense, if the patient does not respond, it gets a bit too late to change, uh, change therapy at which point the patient has already progressed, has metastasized, gotten very aggressive, toxicity has caught in. The patient, if cancer doesn't kill the patient, cardiac arrest or something else will kill the patient. So, so that's where it's very important that right at the beginning we identify uh, which patient is most suitable for what type of treatment. And that's where precision medicine or personalized medicine comes in. You can't treat all patients or at the same at the same uh, level. So you may have two lung cancer patients who have similar type of tumor, but one responds, one does not respond. That's that's where all these uh, additional information from imaging or genetics or uh, other immunohistochemistry can all add in and 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 help in the decision making. So coming back, uh, how I started. So we did some initial uh, research as part of my PhD. Uh, I had a very motivated supervisor, as I mentioned. Um, he used to come to my lab every Tuesday. I used to remember every Tuesday at 2 p.m. he used to be in the lab. As a PhD student, if I have someone as eminent radiologist coming to my engineering lab in the UK punctually every Tuesday, I thought, okay, is this guy giving me so much time, I better deliver. Let me, let me show him what I can do. So every Tuesday, it felt like I had to show him something more than the previous week. So the motivation that he and I shared grew where I kind of completed my PhD, which was a four-year course in, in, in under three years. And say, and again, that's where entrepreneurialism comes in. I guess probably that's the Indian jugaad that we have. You know, I saved one year of my funding, which I asked the institution in UK to fund my research fellowship. I used that to create a proof of concept I, I'm a very resourceful person. Again, that's our Indian trait. We look at whatever resources we have. Whatever limited resources we have, we should not be shy about going and exploring and exploiting it to the T. Uh, nothing is going to be served to you in a platter. You need to go and knock the doors. You know, if, if you don't, op an opportunity doesn't come knocking twice. You've got to be ready with it. You've got to be bold. And one thing I think I wrote in my PhD thesis, I think, um, I don't remember the, um, the full, um, the full um, uh, quote, but the quote goes to say something along these lines, that nothing, um, nothing is more important than perseverance. I think one of the key message earlier um, was, you should never ever let go. Whatever anyone says, obviously you can't be f stupid about it. It has to have some relevance. It has to have some credibility. But if you believe in it, you, you shouldn't let go of it. You should, you should put in everything. I think genius will not substitute it. Whatever amount of um, uh, intellectual capabilities will not substitute it. You may have all of these, but if you don't persevere with what you believe, you will not reach the finish line. I think that's a key message. If you want to take one message from my experience, I think that's one thing I would um, want you all to take home today is to never let go and always persevere with what you believe in. Um, the other aspect is, as I said, resourceful. Um, 
you need to see what, what there is out there. Um, exploited to the T, and, and as I said, one thing led to the other. I, I remember one, my, uh, uh, my, my supervisor once used to say, uh, in terms of perseverance, I did not know when my next month's funding was going to come in, but I still was persevering with it. And he used to tell me, you're, you're pretty bright and intelligent, you can go and apply elsewhere um, and, and get any other job and so on, but I never let go to the point that he used to say, are you doing any sort of Hindu black magic and so on, you know, because from nowhere funding used to come at the very last minute. And that was probably because I believed in it, I was happy to put in the late hours, be it weekdays, weekends. So I think that was my passion uh, in, in terms of getting it. And the passion was to revolutionize patient care. Now today, the software has been deployed globally, um, um, and I'm very connected with my Indian roots, so I'm very proud that it's being used in a number of Indian hospitals, be it at Tata Memorial in Mumbai, or PGI Chandigarh, or Ames Delhi, or a few other private hospitals in and around India, along with other institutions in UK, US, and um, uh, Europe, and uh, Australia, and so on. It, it really gets me out of bed seeing that somewhere some patient is potentially being benefited from, from the work that I've done. In terms of commercialization, that's key. I am an engineer. I, I thought, OK, just doing the research and science is not good enough. I had to switch hats. Being the, being the inventor, I could market it better than anyone else. I could talk the language. I could speak to the radiologists or my customers or CEOs of the hospital or the oncologists and convince them the merit of the technology. So I used to switch from my scientific hat on to my entrepreneurial hat on. I don't have any formal MBA degree, but I learned the, the traits in, in, in following the pursuit of, of this goal. So one thing led to the other in terms of uh, spinning it out as a limited company in the UK, raising funds, seed capital, and at one point, when it grew organically, I reversed it into a public listed company in the UK, which is listed on the London Stock Exchange, grew it from there, um, and I spun on another limited company and grew that into another uh, PLC as well, public listed company in the UK. So what this has also taught me is, and I also kept my academic hat on. I think there's, I, I need to stress that entrepreneurial is important, research is equally important. You need to be updating yourself with the latest tech and doing research. So for the last 18 years that I've been there, I've always been um, an academic, be it in University College London, where I'm half-time academic, and the other half, I'm entrepreneurial. So I like to translate research from, from literally from research to clinic. Regulatory, that's another very important thing. We have been met, met tech companies. You are, we are all strictly bound by regulations, be it your uh, ISO certification, or CE marking, or FDA certification, or the in Indian um, uh, equivalent. This is all quite key, because ultimately, you are impacting patient lives, and, and nothing is more riskier than impacting life of another human being. So obviously, for right reasons, there are regulations. Following that, understanding that, it's a very boring aspect, very laborious aspect, but it has to be done. It's not very exciting for a scientist, for an entrepreneur to engage in, but that's equally important to do it. And um, in terms of, as I said, research, my research publications and so on gives me the credibility of the research that I've developed and translating it. So obviously all these aspects, so I kind of become jack of uh, many hats, maybe master of none, but all together has made me uh, multidisciplinary, you know, in terms of being, starting off as an engineer, then leading uh, the company as a CEO or scientific director or a public listed company director. So I think all these hats I have learned in, in, in the process. And I think, um, yeah, bottom line is uh, believe in what you do and persevere with your bright ideas. Thank you. I think uh, great journey, Dr. Balaji. Uh, so right from uh, his PhD to the kind of companies he rolled out. So we'll come back to you with some questions. Uh, uh, I'll pick up a couple of words from doc what Dr. Balaji spoke is. One is the resourcefulness, and another is commercialization, where we have uh, none other than Prashanji, who heads the 
industry chamber here in Pune, which is uh, the biggest and the oldest uh, industry chamber, chamber of commerce in the country. Uh, and I think he is the most resourceful person here in the hall. So, uh, Prashanji, uh, a very simple question for you. Like, you have seen like journey from an idea to a proof to MVP. So, coming to you as a heading the Chamber of Commerce, uh, if you can throw some light for our young researchers and students, especially on how collaborations are very important and what kind of support uh, one should seek in the market from MVP to pilot, how industries uh, can actually help them and what kind of uh, industry infrastructure is also available in this region, if you can throw some light on these aspects. Yeah, is it okay if I ask one quick question before I start? Yes, please. Thank you. All yours. Just with a raise of hands, how many of you are studying uh, MBA in Health Sciences? Just to understand who I'm addressing. MBA in Health Sciences. I got it, thank you. How many of you are studying MBA other than Health Sciences? Anyone else studying MBA other than Health Sciences? No. Okay. What are the students from the other, other than that, who are the other students? Medical College. <laughs> Nutritions. Nutritionist. Biotechnology. Okay. All right. Now, I understand the professors and research scholars, but I just wanted to understand the large number of students and where you come from. So, I'll start with a tiny story. Uh, I remember uh, sitting like this in the classroom, it's been many years now, in the business school that I studied. Exactly like this, the sitting arrangement. Those days, we didn't have phones, so nobody was looking in the phone. But yes, mostly we were sitting like this. Uh, and we all wondered, how we would get the best job, like many of you would think after the, after the college. Many of us got job in uh, best of the consulting firms, best of the uh, banking firms. They made ton of money as compared to those who worked in marketing and HR and rest of it. So I said, wow. To cut the long story short, today, 20 years down the line when I look at the batch, there are possibly two or three candidates, and there may be more, but I'll just pick up two or three of them, that made both the highest amount of money, if that's any measure, also very satisfied with what they did. And you know who they are? They are the people who took what was there in their mind to the market. Any one of you seen the brand W? I guess you would have, right? So that's one of them, a classmate. Uh, who started W and who is the CEO of W now. And of course, uh, only joking, but he says, I, today I realize what women really want, but that's just joking. Uh, because he, he needs to understand to design those products, right? Another one, uh, gaming, I think many of you play, Nazara Gaming, uh, that's the other one. I understand this doesn't connect with possibly health sciences, so I'll quickly come back to the health sciences. But why are one more small example? for researchers, professors, and many of you who would want to do research after your post-graduation. Some of you, uh, maybe researchers and others, would have heard of Dr. George Whitesides, uh, a professor in Harvard, H index of about 282, a multi-millionaire, a professor who teaches regularly, who's been teaching for the last three, four decades, is a multi-millionaire. I think, in India, we have lots of places of worship for those who believe. Some of those include, there is a temple of Lakshmi Mata, there is temple of Saraswati Mata. We understand how to travel from temple of Lakshmi Mata to temple of Saraswati Mata. Many of you are doing, parents or your own money you spend now, and eventually you will get a degree. That's travel from Lakshmi Mata's temple to Saraswati Mata's temple, right? The other way around, possibly somehow we have not learned. How do we travel the other way around? I think the other way around journey is the mind to market journey. Right? Professor George Whitesides did that wonderfully well. He started many companies, he's a multi-millionaire. What the research is, I'm not equipped to talk about. There are brilliant researchers who talked about it. So I'll not touch that topic. I'm only talking about that it's possible, it's being done. Now you might say that's Harvard story, that's Boston, that's East Coast that's out there in US, right? What's happening here? So we'll not go too far, we'll just talk about Pune. Two, three weeks ago, I went to an industrial estate and uh, in a tiny little room of 1,200 square feet and I met a lady, Dr. Uh, 
what's her name? Dr. Anuya Nisal. Now she's a researcher in NCL National Chemical Laboratory. And some of you might have heard of her. I went there because a classmate of mine who wanted to explore if he wanted to invest in that firm, so he wanted me to just do a bit of a Reiki to understand. Now this lady who is a researcher in National Chemical Laboratory, she's, the name of the firm is Serigen, if some of you would want to use the Google uh, at later stage, not right away. Uh, they are producing a product that does bone regeneration. Hopefully I'm using the terms in the right manner. Uh, bone regeneration. In my own language, the way I understood it is if there is an accident, there is a damage to the bone that could be regenerated using silk. And this is a research that they did in the early days in the National Chemical Laboratory. They already have a product. They're testing in one of the major hospitals here in Pune. No marks for guessing on which hospital to, while working on bones in Pune, but they're doing that and then they're working on the second and third product as well. The point is it's possible and it's happening here. What was in their mind to what was there in the papers that they published to what was the MVP, the minimum viable product, to getting some level of funding, and the funding like Nidhi and other fundings which you will find out in Venture Center that Dr. Premnath is running in Pune, or many other places where you would get the seed funding. Of course, the journey isn't as easy as making it sound, because the real researchers would know how long does it take, how many failures that they go through, right? I'm not denying any of that. But you have these options where you would get certain funding, and then if you have long enough of a patience, right? Because unlike the e-commerce world, where the failure is quick, <coughs> in this world, that's a major difference. The failure isn't quick, unfortunately. You'll have to take long time to try something, to get it registered, to get the, all the regulatory compliances, try on patients, um, try on animals, etc. try on patients, humans, and then eventually you might have a success. But when you have a success, the impact is the biggest, both in terms of success as well as satisfaction. And hence, that journey of mind to market comes back to mind in terms of both having the success and satisfaction. Right? If you're prepared for it, if you believe you would want to do this, that's a brilliant thing to do if you're a researcher. Even for some of those people who are MBAs studying management in healthcare, right? I gave you two or three examples. In your own field, what you can do. If you believe you have this in you to do something more than just get the monthly salary check, then there are enough of examples to take in what's in your mind to the market. Last couple of minutes and I'll hand it back to you. Peter Thiel, there's a very nice book called Zero to One. Some of you might have read it already. It will always require to create zero to one journey first and then there is one to end journey. The zero to one is the toughest journey and all the three research scholars talk to you about this. Toughest journey, zero to one. One to N isn't tough. In the zero to one journey, as also Dr. Balaji mentioned, if you have perseverance, quote unquote, right, it will happen. I'll also say one more thing, which you may not expect on this panel or in this discussion. If it's not for you, it's all right if it's not for you. It's okay not to do entrepreneurship. It's absolutely okay to do the jobs. It's all right, there's nothing wrong. But if you want to give it a shot, you must. If you want to give it a shot, you must understand that it takes a little longer journey because this is delayed gratification. Unlike the world of 140 characters, possibly paying $8 and getting the blue tick, it's not that. Or looking at one of those reels, it ain't that. I'm not saying there's anything good or bad about it. That's not the point. But it's not that. It's not T20, it's that dull and boring test match. If you'd want to play that, you might as well realize that that's what you are in for. But the rewards are fantastic, right? So you need to identify, is that you? And that might take time as well. It doesn't happen by flipping a coin. It takes time and that's all right. I think I'll just stop there. If there's any other question, I'll take it. Thank you. Uh, so when it comes to, uh Entrepreneurs, uh, question for Prashanji again. When it comes to entrepreneurs in engineering sector or field, uh, so we look at Pune as an industrial hub and then we can actually go to any small scale industry. They can help for prototyping or so. Uh, if, if 
you look at the participants or audience here, uh, people always have these doubts, okay, will I get this particular support? Because then there are only uh, very few research laboratories. So uh, can you help the participant understanding, like what kind of support uh, the chamber can offer and how chamber enables the industries actually to collaborate or industry and academy to collaborate and maybe translate the research or take the research or maybe ideas from lab to market. Uh, how, uh, what kind of support is available in this ecosystem, especially at Pune and at national level because you work at national level also. Yeah, and by the way, the college uh, or the institute which Prashanji was mentioning is none other than IMA, I guess I'm, I'm right. Yeah. It's been many years ago so that we can forget yeah. that. Coming yeah. back to the, uh, the questions that you asked, right? Look at this example of Serigen. It found a hospital right here that's supported in the clinical trials. Right? So it can, it's possible to, to make that happen here. Look at the other example of what we did at Chamber. We asked many academic institutions to tell us their research that they believe can help the industry. And we would take that to about 3,000 companies and we'd ask the companies, do you think this would help you? And if it does help you, we'll put you both in the same room. We'll serve all the coffees and snacks and make sure that you have enough time to figure out how can you partner with each other. And we got about 10 such ideas and we're exploring how do we help them. Third, we look at agri-tech startups, just to give an example. Uh, my colleague uh, Neeraj is also working with me on this, he's here. On those startups, we're getting uh, Mr. Ajinkya Rahane day after tomorrow, I think 8th, na? 8th of November. And we're trying to put together a fund to make sure that we put a seed fund in some of those agri-tech startups. Ra let me pose a question, other than the people in the front row, is there anybody who has an idea who would want to take to an industry and let me do the conversion in real mode here and now? Anyone can raise the hand. Why keep a theory? Anyone who thinks, other than those in the front row whom I have heard, anyone who has an idea that you would want to take to the industry, any idea, raise a hand and talk about it and I'll talk to you about it now. No, the idea wasn't to kind of win the argument. That's not the point. I was not trying to win the argument, not trying to be cheeky. The idea just to say that when you have an idea, do come back, it's a good idea to discuss and figure out what is it that we can do about it. But remember, the guy who does business goes through lots and lots of troubles by the time he does business. So he would ask you enough questions to make sure that it actually makes money. One of those interesting challenges for the, from, from traveling from the Saraswati Mata temple to Lakshmi Mata temple is the following. In one, the first temple, right, there is a lot of importance given. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just stating the facts. I'm not making any judgment on this. Is on the H index or is publishing papers, etc. This is my own work, publish paper. Now, what do you see in the future? Will it be useful or not? I don't know. Whereas in the industry, it's the other way around. Give me the same thing that I can now produce right now. If I invest 10 rupees, I'll give 12 rupees, I'll give 12 rupees, I'll give 12 rupees. Now there is a huge gap between these two worlds. Huge gap. All sides need to travel equal distance. Unfortunate part is every side says, how can you travel and come, come down to my street? It just doesn't happen. The world operates on incentives. We'll have to figure out what's the incentive for the other side, for that side to look at me and want me to partner with him or her, or that in entity, right? So I'll just say that anyone, especially the younger students have any idea, talk to your professor, happy to connect with him. Thank you so much. Wow. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Prashanji. And actually, the question he asked that, do you want to share the idea? Normally, we'll see a uh, lot of people will hesitate. And it also goes with one of the basic principle in entrepreneurship that uh, you should discuss your ideas very openly and that is where he was coming from. Normally it happens so after such kind of workshops or someone, people start walking uh, behind the entrepreneur or who is the guest speaker So I have an idea, I want to talk to you in person, I can't share my idea publicly, which actually goes against the principle of an entrepreneurial mindset. So, so thank you for uh, bringing in that also. I think uh, we'll open the floor uh, uh, for Q&A to both Dr. Balaji and uh, Prashanji. Uh, if any questions are there, uh, if you can rotate the mic, please. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
Any questions? You can raise hand. Maybe the mic will come to you. Oh, yeah, we can allow questions so, from uh, you. You know, just to add uh, to what Mr. Prasanji said, uh, yes, healthcare. Yes, it is a long, you know, long journey. But as the ecosystem is being built, there are a lot of uh, small stuff also that people can do. In fact, the way e-commerce is being developed now, it is not developed in a year where people are doing small, small jobs. Even in the healthcare, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Balaji uh, was talking about, that there will be people who will be able to provide those data. How to process this data, you know, data. So people can have company uh, related to data processing. Yeah, yeah? If, I, if, if I may just add, um, I think, one has to be astute. You don't want to do, uh, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You want to make the greatest impact by least effort. Because as Prashant was saying, effort is going to go in tremendously when you're going to be an entrepreneur. And not just effort and time, a lot of sacrifices on personal level, family, whatever, which one has to weigh whether it's worth doing or not. So uh, being an entrepreneur is, yeah, you know, you will probably cut off from your social life or so. Initially, when you are actually trying to get it off the ground. But one important thing I wanted to highlight is maybe this is relevant for any health technology. There is a qualification process. Now, people feel, um, okay, if you have done some initial proof of concept or done some validations, you had a Eureka moment and you hit the jackpot. Unfortunately, that's not the case, particularly with healthcare. And it's, it's actually um, a pyramid-based approach. Now, being healthcare, you need to show first the proof of concept of the technology, which will involve some technical validations. Then there will be some clinical validations to actually show it's trying to address that clinical question. Fortunately, unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. You then need to show if it's some sort of a blue sky research which shows some clinical validation, you need to prove what it means biologically if it's something totally out of the world. Because you have clinicians who have studied biology, they understand what biology is. So you need to relate to that with that new technology. And again, it doesn't stop there. Then the next step is in terms of clinical utility, cost effectiveness clinical adoption. These are slightly boring stuff, but very important in terms of making and breaking your technology seeing daylight and commercially being rewarding. When I say um, cost effectiveness, I'll give you an example. UK, for example, will not adopt a healthcare technology. It may be even Nobel Prize winning technology if it doesn't fall within a cost barrier. They have addressed this through NICE, I can give you the example which stands for National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which says they will adopt any new healthcare technology if it brings about one additional year of patient's life for X uh, amount of pounds. I think it's around 25, 30,000 pounds. So what they're actually saying is your healthcare technology should fall within this cost bracket. And India is an even more price sensitive market. Everything that you have here has to fall in within a certain price. It's a heavily negotiated price sensitive market. So you may think that, okay, you will find an excellent piece of kit or technology which solves a problem, but if it's cost prohibitive, it is not going to see daylight. So you also need to think about how you make your technology cost effective. At the same time, you also need to address the clinical adoption. Now, this is a very huge area where I'll give you an example. My technology being a radiology-based technology, we had, we did a clinical trial in Australia in, in lung cancer where we had multiple physicians giving inputs on this technology. It was oncologist, chest physician, radiologist, nuclear medicine, histologist, everyone. Everyone but one discipline were totally supportive of my technology. Could you all tell me who the barrier was for that technology amongst those five entities I told you, which was oncologist, chest physician, radiologist, 
histologist, and maybe uh, a, a coordinator or so. Any guesses? The same profession for whom I've developed the technology, radiologists, were the barrier. The reason why, for them, it was an additional software. For them, it was something that they had to do additionally. Ultimately, we are all human beings. We all want to get done quickly and bugger off. We don't want to sit there, OK, one more. Balaji has brought up a new technology. Let's use that as well. It's an additional effort. No one has the time or patience or effort to, to do that in a busy clinic. The oncologist wants it, but oncologist doesn't need to do anything. It's a radiologist who needs to use the software and give the report to the oncologist. Oncologist is very happy with the end result, but the effort is going in by the radiologist. So the radiologists themselves, who saw tremendous value in the technology, were a barrier. And now to address that, we automated the system so that the radiologist doesn't need to put additional effort. The results are there when he's going to read the scan. Then the radiologists were also up for it. So this is something that you will not understand until you get into it. And this can make or break. If the radiologists say they don't want to use it, it may be brilliant. Everyone's approval may be there. If your main user doesn't want to use it, your technology will not see daylight. So that is clinical adoption, getting it fitted in within the existing workflow, not, you know, radiologists don't like, I'll be very, very uh, uh, critical. They don't like to change the functionality of their mouse buttons. If the left click does magnification and the right click does change in window, if someone goofs up and changes that, they go livid. They are not used to it because they are totally used to one sort of process. And human beings, fortunately, unfortunately, don't like change. So although we want new technologies, but we are very averse to change. Again, that's all psychological mindset that we need to overcome. So it's not just the technology. There's also a lot that one needs to do in terms of actually getting it adopted in practice. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Balaji. Actually, this, that's the difference between the health tech uh, innovations and rest of the industry innovations, I'll say rest of, because uh, here it is directly uh, impacting on someone's life. And that's why the trials and you have so many other barriers. So the systems are there, which uh, he said, which is boring and you have to go through it because the systems are there because then you can't simply play with human life. It can be you or me also. Yeah, and that's where, uh, but yes, it's happening uh, in, in some other conference like this a few weeks back. Uh, I had an expert sitting in a panel who said that what happened to fintech is going to happen to health tech also in country like India. So at multiple levels, uh, at uh, multiple stratas, we are having new innovations, maybe the product base, process base, or service base, portability in healthcare, uh, affordability in healthcare, or the assured model uh, kind of systems are also coming up. It will take some time, but of course the time of trials is going down, so there are a lot of positive signs. And of course, as you said, uh, change is something which we resist uh, normally. But uh, I think sometimes the pandemic was good or bad, I don't know. But normally when we are posed with ch these challenges, uh, people start adopting to new changes. If you look at uh, digitization or digital technology adoption across industries, including education industry or so, and if you meet the IT experts or so-called expert in the, all those industries. Everyone is saying that this is what we were pushing for last 10 years. It happened in 10 months. So sometimes, yes, it is better to have uh, this kind of challenges. Of course, the pandemic was not good. Nobody will agree. But, but yes, of course, when we are posed with challenges, uh, I think uh, people start accepting the change very fast. And uh, we have some good signs happening in healthcare uh, also. Any, any uh, I think we can take one question. I can see uh, the organizer. <laughs> standing there, so if we can take one question. Uh, yeah. Any questions from students or researchers here? Yes, please. So it's 8 o'clock, so we can take, of course, one, one more question. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, I'm, from, uh, I'm a master's student from Nutrition and Dietetics. So uh, we have this specialization called nutrigenomics in our course, and we also uh, we also have a course uh, on precision uh, pre precision medicine. 
So uh, I think precision medicine and precision nutrition also go parallelly. But then when, uh, as master student, when we go into research, we don't have much area like, uh, or scope in India. So can you like, uh, give us some idea about how we can uh, start uh, working in, uh, in this area like precision nutrition or precision uh, or epigenetics nutri uh, or in any nutrigenomics field? Like I'll tell you what, I don't have answer to this question, but I'll still give it a shot. There are many such questions where we do not know exactly what you'd want to do, right? I think the best thing to do, like most of you would search on the Google, find it out who are the best experts, what they're talking about, and figure it out. And many of us have solved many problems like that. Unless you ask me about my managerial experience or his world of radiology, or his world of nanotechnology and her world of nanotechnology and what else did working, right? Most other questions, and if they have answer, they might address it specifically. Most other questions I will address by doing a bit of search. And that's just an example. There might be many such questions in everybody else's mind, right? Talking to some people and getting that. But I'll leave it here. If there is specific answer, they might as well. There's nothing more. I think you should talk to the experts. Uh, someone would have done uh, a specialist in in, in, in precision medicine in, in, in that space. Um, so I think reach out to your faculty through them, see what experts, as, as Prashant was saying, are doing. Uh, unfortunately, that's not my direct area of expertise where I can't give you any specific advice, uh, but there sure would be um, uh, other experts around. Hey, just one liner. In both those words that you talked about, both those courses, there is a good opportunity to travel from mind to market for sure because that's where the world is leading, right? To have a personalized uh, prescription, so to say, if I would use that word, right? Uh, there is one good company uh, here, Dr. Nikhil Zakaddar and Dr. Nikhil, the second name? Uh, both are Dr. Nikhil. They, s they started it here in Pune, and they're working on one of these two areas that I know for sure if you Google search, you'll find it out, you know, and how they're trying to make it a lot more personalized one. Thank you. I think another good resource is the clinicaltrials.gov, which is like an international um, in, uh, international uh, portal for all all clinical trials that's happening, and 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 generally clinical trials would happen for novel questions. So if you probably want to search for your specific areas in there or your usual PubMeds and so on for published literature to see what people are doing in that space to give you some brainstorming ideas of what you want to do in terms of specialization or higher education. I think that's where, that's where you would probably want to start off with. Uh, I really, I'm really not qualified to answer the question, but I see an opportunity, an idea here for the students sitting on this side of the uh, hall. Uh, and I'm taking input from Prashanji and uh, Dr. Balaji is that, so there is an, op that it means that people like me we don't know about what's happening in health tech, healthcare in Pune in different sectors. So I have heard of Dr. Nikhil Jakaddar, but I really don't know the company, what he's doing. And like all of you also don't know, uh, how many health tech companies are there in Pune? What is happening in wellness sector in Pune? So there is a business opportunity. Like he mentioned one of the source where you can go and search something. You can actually make something okay where people can come and you can actually develop a commercially viable solution where people come to you for this particular information. It's not only Google, because you know there are so many companies in different sectors where you actually provide meaningful data, not information. Meaningful data, meaningful knowledge, and meaningful connects, what Chamber does, okay? And then you enable people to actually pursue that. There might be laboratories, but one lab doesn't know what other lab is doing. So there is a commercial viable opportunity I see there from your question, I, that's the input. No, there are companies like uh, Dr. Zakadar's company, GenePath. Uh, one of those many things that they do is, for example, uh, they would tell you specific personalized prescriptions dealing with your diabetes, let's say, you know, or glucose levels, let's say. So, and a bunch of other areas as well. There is a company called Helios, for example, here, uh, that does physiotherapy, right? So many opportunities, and there are a bunch of other companies like Helios that are also working on physiotherapy. Leveraging the digital connect, or the internet, so to say, and the field that you operate in, you would be able to create one of those. Don't forget that somebody sitting in very this room few years later might be making those millions. 
So, if, uh, and if that's one of you, start believing it now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we'll stop here.